Well, hello. This is a TU Dare special on trout fishing and stream habitat restoration in Buffalo County. I am your host, Peter Jonas, and with me today we have Todd Mao, and Todd is the retired um, conservation. Conservation officer? Conservation? District conservationist. District conservationist for uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and he was located in Alma. And then um, we have Tim Solway here, and Tim is the resident sage of the Wamandy Rod and Gun Club. He is a, um, a farmer and a builder. He is, has a grass-fed beef operation in beautiful Jaeger Valley, uh, beautiful pastures there on the stream, and I'd like to welcome you both today. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, um, Tim, were you born in Jaeger Valley or? or... That's correct. Okay. So, yeah. um, so you are from there. We've, we've established that. Okay. that so tell me a little bit about what trout fishing was like um, when you were a boy. Trout fishing when I was a boy. Um, born in 1961, so um, by the late 60s I was a fortunate um, kid. I had a, a family tradition of very interested trout fisher people. <laughs> <laughs> Great grandparents on down to my grandparents, my uncle, and uh, far off cousins that we did claim. A um, lot of lot of outings for the for the family. It was something that that we really enjoyed. Um, grew up with it, and it's followed me my throughout my life. And um, the 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 fishing at that time was. With today's reviewing, going back and looking to that era, uh, very few trout, uh, not a lot of habitat, everything was put and take, um, no natural reproduction. So to go back to that era and uh, reflect on, on how things were then and how they have land practices and Everything has improved to the point where we have a, a wonderful fishery that everyone can enjoy. Hmm. So specifically, um, how were brook trout doing in those days? Um, back in those days, it was, like I stated, just a brown trout <coughs> uh, put and take. Um, local uh, rod and gun clubs, Fountain City Club had a rearing uh, they had a rearing facility, the Wamney Club. Um, they had a rearing facility, so it was domestic browns that were raised in these uh, stock or uh, rearing ponds and uh, released into area streams and not a large number. So uh, due to the fact that there just wasn't the habitat and Conditions weren't con conducive to, uh, you know, holding a steady, uh, good population of fish. So it was um, pretty sparse. Yeah. As far as fish numbers. Yeah. You said to me that um, the only brook trout that you encountered when you were young were in these ponds that dairy farmers kept their milk jugs in. Yeah. Yeah. Let me. Tell so, the folks about yeah, that. Buffalo Trumbull County, we have a lot of uh, spring heads. Yep. And so part of the problem for uh, non, well, that's point pollution, was the dairy, as the dairy industry advanced and became more, um, more of the economic uh, engine of the county, or the counties, um, most barns and uh, farmyards if they possibly could do it, they were building as close as they could to the spring heads to cool the milk, water the cattle and the horses. So the um, spring house was where uh, dairy farmers 
kept their milk in cream cans till it could be transported to the local uh, processing plant. So, of course, they did not want contaminated water in their spring house because they also a lot of times had rams that they pumped water up into their homes to use instead of digging a well. And in the end, when the brook trout were being basically wiped out of the area due to post-World War II, when chemicals came onto the uh, scene, uh, the cropland was uh, plowed, it was sprayed, uh, massive floods, a lot of soil erosion, gullies mm -hmm. were forming, and uh, basically wiped out all the trout. And getting back to the spring house, it was the last stronghold where some trout would live in among the, <laughs> the cream cans where the <laughs> springs boiled out of the water. <laughs> and then as uh, electricity came along, they didn't need uh, spring houses anymore, so they were kind of left. And the bulk tanks? Yep, bulk tanks came along. And no more canned milk. And now was the end of the last brook trout that hung on in the spring. Heads. Yeah, one comment about <laughs> Tim, Tim's comment is uh, the, the spring heads. You find numerous ones all over the county where the springs are right there, and they're not just a little spring you put your sippy cup in. I mean, they were big big springs coming out of the ground where they could hold trout actually you know maybe a little bit of manipulation make a trout pond out of them or like Tim said when they had canned milk run them through there and the trout could surely survive there. Okay. Yeah okay. And, and they wanted enough enough depth in their yep. spring house yep. yeah. so that the cans were submerged well it was just mm -hmm. like a mini trout pond and, yep. and then when those days were over and the bulk tank came the water was just left to, you know, release. Yeah. No more mm. fish. No <laughs> serious. Yeah. And that was it for the for the whole watershed. Right. Yeah. So Todd, when did you arrive in Buffalo County, and uh, what were fishing and stream conditions like in those days? Uh, I started in Buffalo in August of 1988, uh, the year of the drought. Uh, probably not a good year to measure things yeah. by. Um, not being an active trout fisherman, I wasn't, I didn't pay attention to that a whole lot until I, I got involved in these projects by way of the rod and gun clubs, the conservation clubs. But I remember hearing conversations from local people uh, from the conservation warden about the excitement of opening day of trout season and people were camping and going trout fishing and comparing notes on where they were going fishing, what they were catching and how big a fish. So I remember that in the late 80s, early 90s, the excitement about that. Um, and then that waned and basically went away and no one really talked about it until later in the late 2000s when we started these projects and that really picked up steam. Um, with, with the clubs and the, and the landowners and farmers that, that did these projects. And now we're back to the point, like Tim said, our population, our, our, I think our fish size from some of the DNR surveys, and, and uh, some, I know you have to be careful of listening to fishermen's stories, but uh, <laughs> no, a lot of people catch no, they're all <laughs> solid <laughs> as a rock, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so it's, it's changed a lot and, and you know, and I have people, um, since I've been involved with Trout Unlimited and doing these projects, you don't realize the impact this has outside of this, uh, outside of our local area where people are willing to travel to have fun. Uh, Vernon County, I think, is a very good example of that. Um, and they've proven the economic impact and it's probably not been like that here in Buffalo, but people come here to fish. Um, they will travel a full day to come to Buffalo County to fish and so it's yeah it's it's been exciting to see it kind of subside and now it's the excitement's back again and again I don't know I was not an active fisherman through the 90s you know I started this along with my participation in these projects and you know continue yeah. to do that now with the grandkids yeah. and so, you know, I think one thing that we've tried to promote is we did have a, a, a Boy Scout in the Eagle Scout program. He put yes. 
the sites of the public access points on the UW Extension's website. Today. So it's, it's open to everybody. I mean, you don't have to call someone, well, where can I go fishing? Because it's out yeah. there now. And then, oh, I forget the author of the book of the trout streams in Wisconsin. Right, uh, right. And, and yeah. most of them are in there now in the updated yeah. version. So. Yeah, that's neat. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So you don't even have to be from here. Correct. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, it's, it's a lot of the money that's, that's coming to these uh, restoration programs are, are, is federal money also. So, you know, to me, it's, it's fair game. Oh, yeah. yeah. Everybody deserves to, you know, yep. participate. Perpetual, as far as I know, they're all perpetual easements. So. We had one 25 year easement, yeah. and, and that's the minimum that anybody will participate in. Otherwise, yeah, everything's been perpetual. Yeah. Farmers have been extremely, extremely happy to participate and do that. And one of our goals, I think, between agencies and the clubs was that there would be no bill for the farmer in the end. I mean, everything. And that included even the legal fees. I mean, all of, all the legal fees up to this date that I'm aware of have been, you know, were donated by the attorney's office. Uh, some in-kind payments from the farmers to do some things, but otherwise, between Trout Unlimited, Fish and Wildlife Service, the Wisconsin DNR, Land Conservation Department, and NRCS through their cost share programs, uh, we've been able to cover 100% of the cost on these projects. So. You bet. Yeah. You bet. Yeah, I want to come back to, to brook trout a bit because I think the history of what the Wamandy Rod and Gun Club and other organizations did to restore brook trout to the county is, is really new to, uh, notable. So, Tim, I'm wondering if you'd just start us out on the story of how brook trout were reintroduced into Buffalo County. Yes, we all knew that there was only one native trout historically in the Midwest, and that was the brook trout. And kind of um, listening to the stories from old timers of back when uh, in the 1920s, uh, the brook trout populations were still strong. You know, even with uh, the agriculture and flooding and, and pasturing, um, there still was a good populations. And so to think that, that that could have been at that time, and then um, streams channelization in the 40s and 50s was very detrimental. Of course, took out a lot of habitat, created um, incisioning, in our streams and just trying to to take an approach of getting some trout established. So first you have to get some fish there. Um, before my time, the Wamby Rod Gun Club, in the mid to late 70s, were able to purchase with club funds some brook trout. Um, they did not put a lot out, you know, it's 50 trout in one little mm. creek and 50 in another creek, and they did stay there. They did not really start out strong as far as successful reproduction. Um, it was more of a put and take, but it was the start of trying to get these fish reestablished in their native habitat of where they were for thousands of years. And advancing into about the early 80s, we tried to do some brush bundling. Um, we did some brush bundling on the Wombie Creek, which uh, ironically, uh, 2010 was restored complete restoration and uh, in the meantime we had purchased brook trout and this was in the early 80s so we kept adding to the pool I guess you could say that and we put up some signs with the landowner's permission brook trout spawning area so at that time then we switched to 
putting all the mature brook trout in after the season. Okay, in the so, fall. In the yeah. fall? Yeah. So if they stuck around for a month hmm. or six weeks, they were ready to go. And, mm -hmm. uh, and they did not have to go very far because we put them all in spring heads, uh, spring ponds, wherever we thought they'd have a good chance to get started. And it just, uh, the population uh, just started, the natural reproduction started occurring and it has not um, stopped since then. Okay. And has gradually expanded to every little feeder stream that can hold a fingerling brook trout. So were those trout able to expand their range? Um, it, there must have been, you mentioned about the brush bundles and that, but yeah. were there also changes in terms of agricultural practices and, and how um, the water quality in streams was progressing in, in that era? And what did that look like? Oh, definitely. Uh, pasturing streams and hillsides. Um, back in the day, um, most farms pastured their woodlots, they pastured the streams. So as, uh, as the dairy industry, what would you say? As changed. Advanced and changed. Progressed, yeah. Yeah. It was more of bringing the forage into the cattle instead of, of sending them out into the hillsides and stream, stream areas to to forage. So things gradually started to heal. Um, soil erosion um, con uh, was, jeez, uh, on the mend. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of uh, contour strips, dams. Um, hay and rotation? Yeah, hay rotations. Um, land use practices kept continuing to be, what would you call it? more people became more aware right aware and conscious of yeah. conservation efforts and yeah maintaining the, the the soil you know with the dark top soils that we have here and keeping that in place instead of letting it get away from us down the river so yeah okay so there's a lot of effort in that yeah. a lot of money spent on uh, waterways um yeah the the, the large uh, incisioning Ditches were closed and waterways. And I think closed. we found taking, you know, cattle out of the woods um, hopefully decreased our runoff, our velocities. Um, you know, especially where, you know, farmers, the woods was a place to put the cows. I mean, they didn't get a chance to really enjoy the woods as far as hunting and that, but it was a place for the cows to go. So sometimes it probably got overused. Mm -hmm. um, you know, same with some of our, our pastures along the streams, but somewhere in between there's a, there's a sweet spot where managed grazing in a stream corridor, or managed grazing in a woodland setting are provide some positive habitats. So yeah, so it's, it's, I think things change. Like Tim said, everybody brought the cattle home. Uh, we left those places all more idle time. Um, you know, maybe now we created the next problem of the manure that produced at home instead of naturally spread. We maybe traded one resource problem for a different one. Um, but, you know, from managing the stream corridor, I think it was all positive at that time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which brings me to the Wamadi watershed project, because that was really, as I understand it, one of the first uh, watershed projects in the state. And how did that come together and what were the goals of that project? Well, that project, that project, the preliminaries on that, I believe, started in about 1984. And that was a, a statewide. Um, right, through the Wisconsin Fund. It yep. was a Wisconsin Fund, but I don't remember the it's, detail. Of yeah, and they were, I don't know how they ranked those streams, but counties had to put together if they wanted to participate in a project, okay, and what do you want to do with this project? And I think that was all done prior to m me getting here in Buffalo, but it, the yes. construction was going on, you know, it was the water quality from uh, probably manure runoff at that time, 
uh, sediment in the stream, um, some habitat work, and most of the DNR studies that I've seen and heard about over the years, the number one issue in streams in western Wisconsin is sediment. Um, mm -hmm. In the springtime, we have that short time period where manure runoff is an issue, but sediment in the streams is overall the number one issue. And, you know, it affects your, your oxygen levels and survival of fish, warming of waters, and related to the brook trout again. So I think that's where a lot of that, what the Wamity Creek watershed came from and um, provided some opportunities for people to, to install some habitat riprap. Lunkers were the big habitat project at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and riprap and stop the erosion on stream banks because anytime you have stream bank erosion, it's 100% deposition into the stream, so. Yeah. And there was a, there was a big push through the, once the watershed was approved. Right to do barnyard runoff right. systems, which I think helped a lot. Oh, oh yeah, instead of just having to small that nitrogen and, and open channel and manure going to the streams, yeah. they had some type some type of filtration system. There was a variety of things they could choose from, and it all, but it provided a place for the cattle to be during those springtime when the ground is soft. You don't want them out in places, but they could be on the yard. We had a way to manage the manure runoff and um, yeah, it was, it was a great opportunity for farmers yeah. to yeah. take advantage of it. Yeah. And those were, through, through that priority watershed, I believe it was up to 80% flush here on some of them. On those. some of them. Yeah, yep. that's Six, 65 up to 80, yeah, yeah. And, you know, there, s yeah. certain situations yeah. were 80, but most of them were 65 to 70. But yeah. there were some opportunities there for farmers to take advantage of that. And those yeah. opportunities were economically unfeasible for a, a smaller farm. Right, 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 yeah. Right. Just too cost per day. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. so what it was also was um, that Buffalo County or the Wyoming watershed became the number one, or the first, was that almost every stream was classified as impaired. And let's see, it was going in 1985, I believe that was the first year of signups and work being done. Probably, yep. And it ran all the way through to 2001. I would say that inspired probably local rod gun clubs or, you know, conservation minded people to, um, to improve upon that with actual um, site-specific stream restoration. Mm -hmm. Right, and it built oh, up to that, and then, you know, that was the time when, you know, agriculture went through a massive change, and yeah. we lost the small herds, and, you know, we went to the 100, 200 cow herds, and then we went to the large dairies that we have today. So there was a extremely fast-moving change in, in, in agriculture at the time. Unfortunately, the Wamity helped some of that prior to that change, so. And now we turn to, you know, Todd, when, when you became the conservationist, it seemed like habitat work really advanced during your career. You know, I was talking to Tim beforehand that, was, I think it was about 2007, 2008, when the Elmo Rod and Gun Club came to our office and asked, that we, you know, we want to do a trout project. And, you know, what, what are we going to do with this? And what, what are our possibilities? And we were getting into, Wildlife Habitat Incentive Program, the EQIP uh, was coming on board for, again, wildlife habitat, conservation practices. Uh, so we did uh, pursue a project up on uh, the Johnson Farm in Trout Creek um, with EQIP funds um, and the help of the Elma Conservation Club, Elma Ride and Gun Club. Uh, and that worked out very successfully. I mean, we still have trout in the stream. We've had some storm damage. And then, you know, that led to Wamadi asking, well, what about some farmers down here? And then it was Fountain City up in Eagle Valley. And, and it just went on and on and on. And, you know, for the next two or three years and, and created a lot of excitement, you know, and people were coming in the office. I want to get one of those trout projects like so-and-so's got. Because <laughs> um, they were getting some rock, they were getting some habitat. People were having good luck fishing. You know, and again, it kind of goes back to if the farmer would donate the easement, we would find some funds and kind of leads back to another story of meeting I went to with Duke Welter from TU and 
had talked about his experiences, and uh, this was a big meeting in western Wisconsin, and I said, you know, we have, we have these interests. We've got this club coming to us. We've got some farmers' interests. How do we line up all this money? And he said, if you get the easement, the money will come. And I think, you know, I remember him saying that, and, and since that time, it's, it's been true. Again, it's come from many, many different avenues, but you need to get the easement in place first. That's, yeah. that's yeah. number one. Um, and then, you know, projects fall into place. And, and landowners, farmers are, farmers are absolutely the key, and, and the local clubs are, are the second major key because the, they're the access to, to getting out in the community and letting people know what's going on, and um, it, it just took care of itself. Uh, it, it made our job a lot easier as, as federal agencies because you didn't have to go out and sell conservation. It, it did itself. Mm. I love right. that. Love that. You know, as, as I've been thinking about this, I've been thinking about my own evolution as a angler. And, you know, you start out trout fishing, you're just like laser focused on the stream and you just want to catch a dang trout, you know. And, and then you start looking at the banks and you start looking at the riparian corridor. You know, you're looking, you're looking up at the landscape and pretty soon you're thinking about, you know, the watershed and larger issues that, that affect land and water. And, and, you know, that's coming at it from an angler's perspective. I, I think of the two of you and, you know, you have a much richer understanding from farming and resource management. But I guess I'm also wondering, um, how has your perspective enlarged or evolved over the years through stream restoration projects? And, and I guess, what have you seen or what are you seeing that uh, is, is sort of a way of looking at the horizon for you? It has been, the easements have been so well received yeah, with our landowners, our local landowners. I, I don't see that waning at all. It, it's wonderful to have a waiting list, basically. Right. And yeah. and it's, yeah. We've had we, a waiting Which we have right now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's not, I mean, Peter, you don't have to go out and knock on doors. I don't have Non Buffalo to. County. I no. have people saying, you know, let's, we want to get this done. I just heard it the other day. Um, stop by a bridge. <laughs> Landowner was looking over his bridge because there was a beaver dam there. The news available. Okay, yeah. yeah. And uh, going, yeah, yeah, I want to get this, this signed up here. And, <laughs> get this going and then my neighbor upstream was thinking mm. about it also the headwaters here yeah. so it does uh, you know as long as the uh, funding is there I think you know people are more and more um, want to be responsible take care of their land um, and one thing that we do have in Buffalo and Trumbull County is we have these you know the the wide open valleys with wonderful productive soil. Mm -hmm. Wami Valley has been referred to as the Garden Valley. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was the name of the co-op. Garden Valley Co-op, yep. Yep. Yeah, right. yep. So as good of, of soil as you can find. Right. And these farmers don't want that soil heading down into the Mississippi River. Um, and, and, and another thing that the, the uh, stream restoration does is it stabilizes their field edges also. So they don't have to worry about the undermining and losing, you know, right. it used to be, you could see six, eight corn rows. Right. At least they know they're going to be able to harvest what they plant, where a lot of times those rows ended where it washed out, like Tim yeah. said, or undermined. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, but I think the, another thing about your, your comment about looking at the watersheds and Tim talking about the neighbors talking, these projects really create a lot of conversation in the communities mm. about conservation, about certain projects, about what's going on on the farm and what they're doing and, and just 
and general conservation conversations. And, and I yeah. think it was all good from non-farmers, farmers, landowners, uh, community members, fisher people, um, just good conversation about conservation. So I, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a win-win everywhere around. <laughs> yep. And I think uh, Trout Day. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's been good. This will be, what, 12 or 13 years now? Yeah, 2010. Yep, I think it was the first one in, in Eagle Valley there. And, you know, we started that just to promote the projects, get the kids there. Um, and, you know, from what I've seen, some of the results, it's worked. I mean, kids catch on. They, yeah. they'll, they'll fish for many, many years to come. And if the kids are there, the parents will be there. They have to get there. So um, that's been fun to watch. Yeah, so, big thanks to the DNR crew out of Black River. Oh, yeah. Steadfast. Yeah. Every year since. 2010. Right. Yeah. To just have the ex to see the excitement in the kids, to have uh, mm -hmm. um, the chance to to touch a fish. Right. Yeah. So they yeah. yeah they shock the streams and then bring the fish out for the kids and you know and that's what the kids are there for. They yeah. even, they can talk about habitat, but they're bored with that. They want to see fish. Oh so. yeah. Yeah. So yeah. far, none mm -hmm. of them have fallen in that way. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> We're home with the same number we started with. But, I, I, but the possibility of them falling in and being electrocuted is what makes the event what it is. Right. You know? I mean, that's, that's why people yeah. go. Well, you know? <laughs> so we'll live on the edge a little bit. But. And I remember at Trout Creek, too, when we had it there, when <clears> kids <throat> fished for, what, two hours in the morning, came back, and we have lunch. You know, the clubs, Wamadi is always our... Our chef and, and, and does a wonderful job on the hot dogs and brats and had lunch and grandpa there's no fish in this creek there's, there's nothing <laughs> anywhere we fish down there and then then the crew goes in with their electro fishing and it's like well, that fish wasn't there when I was there. <laughs> Look at all the fish. Yeah. yeah it is humbling that is for certain no doubt about that yeah, yeah. so pretty exciting to see those type of fish numbers yeah. And that really is, uh, tells yeah. the story as far as that part of the restoration. The yep. fish are there. Yep. Well, Tim and Todd, I want to thank both of you for thank you. Uh, just a great conversation. I also want to thank Nancy Bergman, our uh, camera person who uh, has done a wonderful job. Also, Kevin. Um, Bargender and all of the staff at WTCO, the Trimpolo County Public Access Television Station. Without their technical support, this program would not have happened. And so this is Peter Jonas signing off. And until next time, when in doubt, think like a watershed.